Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. I'm Martin Zubko. Today, I'm curious about Russian-Serbian relations. I'm joined by Dr. Vuk Vuksanovic, who is a senior researcher at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy and associate at LSE Ideas, a foreign policy think tank within the London School of Economics and Political Science. Dr. Vuksanovic wrote his PhD about Russian-Serbian relations, where he focused on Serbia as a balancing act between Russia and the West. So I'm 100% sure that he is very qualified to speak about Russian-Serbian relations. Welcome, Dr. Vuksanovic. Thank you. We're going to start with energy, because the one way how to look at the Serbian-Russian relations is energy. Naftna Industria Serbia is de facto responsible for oil and gas in Serbia. In 2005, the company was divided into NIAS, Serbia Gas, and Transnafta. While Serbia Gas and Transnafta are 100% owned by the Serbian government, NIAS was bought by Gazprom Neft in 2008 for 51% of shares the Russian side paid 400 million euros, and also there was a close with 550 million euros as an investment till 2012. At the moment, NIS is owned by Gazprom Neft, which has 50%, and Gazprom, as a company, controls 6.15%. Can we assess Gazprom's role in energy security of Serbia that's the first question. And the second question, Gazprom. Why Gazprom as a company? Why not Rosnev or Lukoy or different Russian companies? And the last question, has Gazprom fulfilled all promises dated to 2008? Well, uh, we have to underline something from the very beginning. Uh, energy is one of the three pillars of uh, Russian influence, not just in Serbia, but in the wider Balkans. Because Russian influence is uh, frequently being uh, theatrically overstated and inflated by much of the Western commentariat, but those sources of influence that Russia does have, it uses them uh, quite skillfully and uh, effectively. These three are the unresolved uh, Kosovo dispute, although you can probably put, for example, disputes about uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina in that, uh, in that same rubric by virtue of Russia being a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Uh, then uh, there is uh, Russian uh, soft power, uh, its uh, popularity among parts of the local population. And uh, pillar number three is the one which uh, you have just asked about, which is uh, energy. So uh, on that point, uh, we have to underline that uh, I haven't been uh, looking at the latest percentages, but uh, Russia is a prim Serbia's primary supplier when it comes to its uh, supply of gas. The statistics differ, but it's about uh, the maximum one I is about 80 per 80 percent. So an enormous, uh, an enormous uh, portion of it. And uh, what is very specific about Serbia that this uh, gas is not necessarily the point uh, that it is about, for example, uh, heating uh, Serbian households. But uh, Serbian uh, industry is uh, largely dependent on the import of, uh, of the gas, so not households. So uh, by default, uh, the supply of gas is very important for the Ser Serbian economy of keeping uh, price and uh, price of issues, uh, price of things like uh, electricity and food in balance, not to burden uh, the, not to burden the and damage the purchasing power and quality of life of uh, everyday population. So that is pretty much where uh, Russia in general fits in when it comes to energy security. These are the calculations which shape. Uh, Serbian Russia energy uh, ties. Now, but of course, there is a very powerful uh, political background which preceded this, uh, this set of relationship which you have uh, just uh, described. Now, of course, ever since the Soviet times, uh, Serbia has been uh, dependent on the import of uh, Russian gas, and of course, much of the uh, and very significant portions of the Eastern Europe, primarily because of the because of the gas infrastructure which has been constructed over decades, particularly since Soviet times. But the story about uh, Russia's Gazprom acquiring the majority shares in, uh, in Serbia's uh, national oil and gas company, Nice, is, uh, much more, uh, is much more recent. 
Uh, namely, back in 2007, the uh, Serbian government at that time hired, uh, of course, uh, uh, the American professional service company, Deloitte, to do uh, an accounting uh, estimate, an accounting estimate of uh, price uh, of what is the value of, uh, of Nice. And uh, at that time, they estimated that the entire value of Nice is on around uh, 2.2 billion. Uh, so that implies that in order for you to get uh, a majority shares, you have to pay a 1.1 or 1.2, 1 1.2 billion for it. The majority shares was sold to Gazprom for 400 million uh, euros. And the funny thing is that in years that uh, followed, some of the people who took part in these uh, negotiations, which led uh, to this transaction, even spoke about how uh, the Russian side brought to these negotiations their own uh, due diligence assessment of uh, of Nice, where they said that, uh, for example, that the entire, that 51% of shares is not even worth 400 million, which they paid that it is worth even uh, less because of the difficult mismanagement issues which uh, burdened the company. So something is not up, whether it is on the Russian side or the Deloitte, the Deloitte uh, side of the equation. However, uh, nice was, uh, if we believe uh, Deloitte, uh, Nice was uh, bought, the majority shares in Nice were bought by Russia's Gazprom, un heavy under the market price. And uh, in the years that followed, uh, some of the political leaders which took part in this uh, transaction, including now uh, former uh, president Boris Tadic, and during whose mandate this transaction happened, essentially said one very uh, important uh, one very important uh, thing and that is that uh, when uh, serbia decided to buy uh, to sell uh, nice to gazprom uh, it wasn't just uh, energy but there were other uh, political considerations as well and essentially there were two major considerations which guided them and the serbian leadership believed that it is worth worth it to sell uh, nice at that price number one they believed that they were getting in that way a guarantee that uh, now defunct project of uh, South Stream gas pipeline would uh, would be constructed across Serbian territory, with uh, Serbia being able to accumulate revenues as a transit country from this uh, project, which would of course compensate for any other uh, for any other shortage of uh, resources that Serbia denied itself with this transaction. While at the same time, there was of course a very uh, second very important issue which was that uh, Serbia needed uh, Russian uh, protection uh, in the UN Security Council because Kosovo was on its way of uh, declaring independence. In 2007, there were already some initial signals regarding that this transaction, that this would be one of the prices that Serbia would have to pay in order to get uh, Russian backing on, uh, on the issue of Kosovo. But with 2008, this was a definitive thing. And there were a couple of minor uh, coalition partners or minor players on the Serbian political scene which opposed this deal. But given that everything in Serbian politics became uh, dominated, that entire political agenda in Serbia was uh, dominated by, uh, by the issue of Kosovo, there were not that many uh, who wanted to say uh, no to the Russians. And more, moreover, Russia even became, uh, as uh, one of the participants from this event was saying, everybody was racing at that time to get a photograph with Vladimir Putin. So it was uh, politically uh, fashionable and uh, profitable at that time. So and this, uh, of course, uh, reflected on the transaction which we have uh, just described. But uh, there have been... Um, there have been some controversies related uh, to Gazprom, while, for example, yes, Nice, uh, nice employees do have a good salary, so they are happy with the way they have been uh, they have been treated by the Russian employees. They have been a whole set of uh, other uh, very uh, problematic issues, like for example the fact that uh, that the rent that uh, Gazprom pays uh, to uh, to Serbian government because with these transactions. Uh, they have also purchased some of the oil fields in Serbia with this uh, transaction, and uh, they don't pay uh, that much uh, that much of a drilling uh, and mining grant uh, to the Serbian uh, government. So, we, which has also shown that there has been a privileged uh, up, that they have uh, had a privileged uh, status, which was uh, politically conditioned. And of course, we had all other sorts of uh, controversies related to this issue, like that, for example. Uh, the director of uh, Serbia Gas is led by uh, is uh, led by its director Dusan Bajatovic, who is uh, a deputy president of Socialist Party of Serbia, 
which is a junior political partner in the ruling Serbian coalition, and it was even a junior partner in the previous uh, government. But they are, this is a party of uh, former uh, Serbian uh, strongman, uh, Slobodan Milosevic, and uh, it has been uh, rep- reputed that unlike the more uh, pragmatic Serbian president, uh, Aleksandar Vucic, uh, the people running uh, the Socialist Party in Serbia, they are also opportunistic, but in comparison, their ties with Russia are much more uh, powerful than are much more powerful than uh, than those uh, of uh, Alexander Vucic in comparison. So this tells you about a whole set of uh, uh, interest links that uh, go along with this uh, transaction. And when it comes to those promises that investment, uh, it was like five hundred fifty million euros. That that happened, or you know. From uh, according to the estimate, it, that it did happen. As I said, they do preserve, they they, they do keep uh, the the company ongoing. But there are other forms of uh, there are other forms of uh, inconsistencies. For example, Serbia Gas, which is led by, as I said, by Dusan Bajatovic, it uh, supplies uh, gas to the private companies in Serbia, but they don't pay for it, and in the end, they compensate it by accumulating uh, ownership ownership in those companies. However, Serbia Gas also does not compensate for the gas it gets from a Nice gas and by extension gas from, but who covers it? it the Serbian government uh, covers essentially this uh, minus which exists. So that tells you about strong degree of political protectionism which exists in that. So in that case, we can, we can say that Gazprom controls the Serbian gas distribution Abs- absolutely, quite a lot of things. For example, they they also supplied some uh, other uh, other things, like for example, uh, gas uh, gas stations, which were also important uh, for the distribution of uh, gasoline to the to the uh, to, to the local market. Right, and in the future, let's say five ten years, speaking from the side of the Serbian Ministry of Energy, do you have any map to diversify natural gas supplies? Or this topic is not on the table at the moment. I'm asking because of Gazprom. So in in my thinking, I, I want to know if Gazprom is going to continue controlling the market, or Serbia or Serbian government they are preparing some sort of diversification projects that are not going to exclude Gazprom completely, but they will have you know a little help from other sources. Well, uh, with the uh, with the war in Ukraine, we have seen uh, two uh, two new potential uh, developments. We have seen that uh, the European Union became uh, heavily uh, invested, uh, heavily invested uh, in uh, energy diversification for uh, southeastern Europe, and we have seen uh, several uh, projects. I mean, uh, the Serbian government has attended the opening of the new intercorrector in Greece in Alexandropolis, which has been financed. By uh, by the European Union. Just a few days ago, we had a meeting between Serbian and the Bulgarian president, also uh, joining new interconnector on uh, on Serbo-Bulgarian border. I mean, I presume that this interconnector, yes, it can be used for the Russian uh, gas, but it is equally important that it can be used for Azerbaijani gas, which will arrive to the Balkans across uh, uh, via Turkey. So we have seen, I mean, what will be, it is still uh, very early to determine, but one thing is uh, that I believe one thing will be the result. I think that it has always been an issue. Not, it was not necessarily even an issue whether you will buy Russian gas or not. But it was always an issue whether you, are, uh, whether you have only one supplier who can potentially use it as a political leverage tool. So while Russia may still in the future be one of the potential uh, suppliers of uh, gas to Serbia, uh, it is. I believe that if all of these projects were to come true, uh, their ability to use it as a political leverage uh, will uh, decrease significantly. But there is, of course, another very big unknown because it is already uh, circulating in the local uh, business and policy community here whether uh, Gazprom uh, can continue uh, to operate in uh, Serbia's uh, market, given that the fact that uh, uh, that the Russian companies and the Russian state are under EU sanctions. And that Serbia is uh, geographically encircled by uh, EU and NATO member states. So, how do you actually function and uh, do your business, conduct your business operations uh, normally in that market? And there have been already speculations about whether, in uh, maybe not in few months, but in for perhaps uh, uh, next couple of years, 
uh, Gazprom decides uh, to uh, shed its uh, shares in uh, Nice and depart from the Serbian market. I mean, we have already encountered several statements from the Serbian president who says if this happened, we are even uh, willing to take some extreme measures, like, for example, temporarily nationalizing Nice and giving perhaps uh, a relatively fair uh, price to the Russians for their departure from the from the Serbian market, while at the same time, of course, uh, a very big uh, question is arising uh, about uh, potential companies uh, that can uh, replace uh, Gazprom. I mean, some are talking about the uh, Hungarian mall, um, and uh, this uh, might have uh, some uh, very strong political logic, given that there is a very strong partnership between uh, Viktor Orban's uh, Hungary and Serbia, led by Alexander Vucic. But we have also seen uh, some... Uh, energy delegations coming from uh, Norway who are also interested uh, in uh, in perhaps uh, Serbia's uh, energy uh, market and not just potentially a uh, gas market, but also potentially a market like, for example, a national electrical uh, distribution, uh, uh, distribution network. So uh, we will see how it goes, but uh, there, is de- there is definitely dyna- some dynamic going on and there, is, there are definitely talks circulating. Slightly off the topic, but you mentioned Azerbaijan. What is the Serbian-Azerbaijan relations in terms of how Russians see it? Well, I mean, it has been a very uh, peculiar uh, partnership because uh, ever since Kosovo declared independence, Azerbaijan has been uh, an important uh, bilateral uh, partner for uh, Serbia. And uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we have to stress, I mean, just like a lot of things, related to Serbian foreign policy, uh, its partnership with Azerbaijan has also been uh, shaped by two uh, systemic uh, events which uh, transformed uh, Serbian foreign policy. And I would say that to this very moment, Serbian foreign policy, including its relationship with many uh, countries in the international system, has been shaped by these two events. Number one is the one which which we have already mentioned, was uh, the independence of uh, Kosovo. And the second one, it has been uh, the global uh, financial crisis of uh, 2008, which, of course, overspilled uh, onto Europe's uh, shores in the form of uh, Eurozone crisis. So Serbia, in a sense, became uh, stranded on the Western periphery because Europe was distracted from the Balkans with its uh, own trouble. So you could not uh, count on an easy perspective of uh, EU membership. Well, on the other hand, the country was also stranded on European periphery, but not just stranded, but stranded with an unresolved territorial dispute. So in a sense, this logic of hedging, trying to form a new uh, partnership, was uh, very important. And uh, Azerbaijan was one of the countries which uh, which grew in importance from that moment on, because for Azerbaijan, uh, Azerbaijan also has its interest in the Balkans, of course, for both Serbia and Azerbaijan, the primary focus is uh, the comparison and analogy between uh, Kosovo and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. That that uh, these two territorial disputes are in the very center, with Serbia and Azerbaijan backing each other in the UN General Assembly. At one point, when in 2015 uh, Serbia was co-chairing uh, alongside Switzerland the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe (OSCE), an organization which uh, supervised the so-called Minsk Group, the conflict prevention mechanism for Nagorno-Karabakh, that was also important for Azerbaijan, as well as, of course, uh, monitoring uh, human rights, which is why this uh, dimension of the OSCE is not uh, necessarily popular in Azerbaijan. But uh, this has been an important element of this uh, partnership, and Azerbaijan also had a very uh, important uh, element why it kept uh, why it needed the part partnership with Serbia. Because uh, Azerbaijan is saw that there is one parallel between uh, events in uh, the Balkans and events uh, in the Caucasus. I mean, during the 1990s, when we had, of course, conflicts in both uh, the Balkans with Yugoslav wars and uh, conflicts uh, in, uh, in the Caucasus, as well as always unstable Middle East, Russia always perceived this region as part of the same uh, continuum uh, of uh, territories burdened by ethnic and religious conflicts with with all the other security pathologies which come along, like, for example, uh, terrorism or uh, Islamic extremism. But there have also they, the Azerbaijanis have also observed that uh, what happens in the Balkans also reflects on how Russia potentially behaves uh, in the Caucasus. For example, when uh, we had uh, the, the signing of the Dayton Peace Accords, which ended uh, the Bosnian uh, Civil War, 
Uh, Russia participated nominally in the international diplomacy which uh, preceded this agreement, but it wasn't that much of an, uh, it wasn't a key player. I mean, primarily because the Americans uh, led the charge as the most dominant power at that time. But it was also the period in time when uh, Russia was bogged down in, in Chechnya, in its first uh, Chechnyan war. Then, of course, the period when Russia was frustrated against uh, the United States and NATO over its uh, intervention in the Kosovo War in 1999, they played a part in uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, decision, to as, as well as in Yeltsin's decision, because it wasn't just uh, Vladimir Putin, but there was also in Yeltsin, who, who was still around, but was about to transition power to his uh, to his successor, decided to escalate the second Chechnyan uh, war to resolve to prevent uh, experiencing any trouble similar to what Serbia experienced with Kosovo and to show its teeth uh, to the West. And of course, we also had the fact that uh, in 2008, uh, when uh, uh, Kosovo declared unilaterally declared its independence uh, from Serbia, that same year, Russia, uh, R- Russia, uh, Russian Georgian War took place when. Uh, Russia invoked the Kosovo precedent in uh, in uh, imposing independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So they did so that, and uh, they decided that it was important to keep a line of communication uh, open with uh, open with uh, Serbia. Of course, uh, Azerbaijan was also uh, many times a source of uh, easy cash in terms of uh, credit lines, where uh, Azerbaijani infrastructure companies were doing some project. This was uh, particularly important in the wake of global financial crisis in 2008. And uh, we do see that uh, Azerbaijan is one of the rare countries with, with several countries with which Serbia has uh, a strategic partnership uh, agreement signed. And uh, even when there are problems, like for example in 2020 when Serbian ammunition was discovered with uh, Ar- Armenian fighters during the fightings in Nagorno Karabakh. Serbian government acts very soon to remedy this problem in Azerbaijan. And we now see that uh, Azerbaijan is an uh, important partner for Belgrade once again, uh, judging from uh, uh, the visit that a couple of months ago uh, had from uh, Azerbaijani President Aliyev to Serbia, where they discussed, among other things, of course, the supply of Ra- Azerbaijani gas via Turkish territory, but also uh, import of uh, Azerbaijani electricity. Uh, be across uh, Turkish territory and th- things to which Serbia can compensate for some of the problems in its own electrical distribu- distribution, which emerged because of the political mismanagement. And we have seen some other developments. I mean, Azerbaijani uh, business delegation visiting Serbia alongside uh, Aliyev, uh, a contract being signed between two countries on cooperating jointly in uh, in the in defense industry with the purpose of winning uh, third markets so azerbaijan is again emerging as something of a, of a, of a, of a partner and a friend who can uh, save you with uh, easy with easy cash so uh, particularly in times of uh, financial troubles that's quite an important point because when we speak about russian serbian relations there are more players and many of those players are quite influenced by what russians are going to do or what the European Union is going to do, what Americans are going to do. So therefore, it's, it's very good to have that other perspective that you just described, because now we can assume that if other gas or oil going to flow to Serbia, Russians might be okay with it. Am I right? Well, I mean, I think that they are. They would. They don't like the idea of having uh, energy diversification. They certainly wouldn't be pleased. But I would also say that at this moment in time, uh, with with the war in Ukraine, I would say that uh, the price of Serbia has uh, also be, uh, rose up in Moscow, Absolutely. because at this because at this moment in time, uh, they are uh, Serbia is important for uh, providing good uh, political optic. Because as long as as long as you have at least some uh, friendly understanding with Serbia, you're not completely kicked out of the Balkans. So Serbia provides with this uh, political optic, this PR mirage that Russia hasn't been completely kicked out of the Balkans. And at the same time, of course, uh, in light of the complete break that we have seen in uh, Russia West and Russia Europe relationship as a result of uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the countries like Serbia and Viktor Orbán's Hungary are uh, important because they provide this uh, optic. We are not completely isolated from Europe because there are still at least uh, some. There are at least some who are still willing to communicate with us. Absolutely. And when you mention Hungary, 
There are two points I would like to discuss with you and your professional opinion. The first one is oil. According to my statistics that I got from yesterday, Norway is 3%, Kazakhstan 10%, Russia 23%, and Iraq 64% as a share on import oil to Serbia. But Serbia needs to diversify this system because of the sanctions. So the YANAF, its functionality is not 100% at the moment because of sanctions. And there are two options for Serbia. The first one is to connect to Dejba. The second option is to build a pipeline through Albania, which basically goes through North Macedonia. And this is 300 kilometers, in opposed to the Dejba, which would be like 130 kilometers. So the first point in terms of Russia, Hungary, and Serbia is the oil. How do you see the possibility that Serbia will connect to Dejba? And what the Russians would think about? Well, I mean, first we have to underline something uh, that uh, now oil is uh, energy. It now has the potential to become a fifth uh, cohesive uh, factor in uh, Serbo-Hungarian uh, relationship. Because we have four cohesive factors which are shaping this uh, partnership. Number one, uh, partial, partial, because there are still differences, ideological compatibility between the two ruling elites in two countries. Number two, a fear of uh, migration from Middle East and Africa into Europe. Uh, number three, the need to have someone to watch your back in case you ever have troubles with the European Union. Number four is the status of a Hungarian minority community in, uh, in Serbian province of Vojvodina. But now there is a potential that uh, Hungary, that energy, might become a fifth uh, cohesive uh, factor in this partnership, that it will be added uh, to the list. Now, of course, a very big, uh, and there are two, of course, uh, stories. Number one is the issue on whether Hungarian mall will take over, uh, will take over uh, the Serbian uh, oil and gas industry, Nice, from, from Gazprom. And that would be politically profitable for uh, for the Serbian government because that way, if uh, the if the Russophilic parts of the Serbian electorate were to be angry over the fact that Gazprom is leaving, Serbian president would make it an easy sell because he can tell to the domestic public, "We are sorry that our Russian friends are leaving, but we are handing we are handing this over uh, to a, a country which is uh, our good uh, political friend and partner." While at the same time, it would also be an easier sell to the, West, to the West because then he can say, well, what do you want? Yes, you don't agree with Hungarian government of, on everything, but at least uh, Serbia's oil and gas industry is no longer owned by the Russians, but it is owned by a country which is a member of NATO and the European Union. So there, there is this type of element of uh, political sell. But the second element is, of course, the one which you have just outlined uh, concerning potential uh, Drurba uh, pipeline. Uh, because uh, this, uh, the Serbia, ever since former Yugoslav days, because this was uh, an oil pipeline which was constructed in former Yugoslavia, gets most of its oil via uh, Yanap, uh, Yadranski Naftovod or Adriatic uh, oil uh, pipeline, as uh, the literal uh, translation would, would be. And uh, it, it goes uh, via Croatia, and uh, that way it is trans. So this is a uh, seaborne oil, which is basically which uh, Serbia imports. And uh, when uh, Russia, of course, uh, offered a privileged uh, oil prices to the country it deemed uh, uh, friendly, which were those countries that did not uh, introduce sanctions against Russia, Serbia seized this opportunity, and for uh, several months it was getting uh, uh, it was getting uh, Russian oil via this. Uh, Yana pipeline at a, pre, at a, at a lower uh, price. Of course, for this type of issue, Serbia would frequently have to get uh, exemption from the EU because of its uh, sanctions. And for a while, it was getting an exemption from the EU. But once uh, the sixth uh, package of sanctions was introduced by the European Union, Serbia could no longer import Russian seaborne oil. As we know, the EU sanctions only relate to seaborne oil. Uh, it wasn't uh, related to the oil imported via, via land, because, precisely because of the countries like Hungary Slova and Slovakia, which are importing it uh, 
that way. So uh, this caused even some troubles with uh, with with the Croatian side, where the Serbian side was accusing that uh, Croatia was the one lobbying for Serbia not to get uh, an exemption from it. And of course, uh, the Croatian side said, well, I mean, Serbia can get its oil from everyone else except from Russia, because why should we allow Serbia to uh, profit from a lower uh, oil prices when everyone else was uh, was suffering? But this caused, of course, another hiccup in uh, Serbo-Croatian uh, uh, relations. And uh, while uh, while we do have this uh, new, re more recent efforts, which was quite energetic to improve uh, relationship between Serbia and Croatia, I still believe that the Serbian government has uh, an ambition to invest uh, and uh, in these two projects. And I am judging from some of the statements. I believe that the Serbian government believes that the uh, we will see whether they will succeed or not. I don't have a crystal ball to predict that. But they do believe that they can have their uh, cake and eat it too in this case, because they do believe that they can also have uh, this pipeline via Albania, which for which they will probably receive uh, EU funding, while from the other side, uh, still uh, doing this project with the Hungarians on uh, Drozba. I mean, for now, it appears that they are not giving up on either one of these projects, but whether some form of international pressures uh, or uh, tit for tat which uh, in, which still exists in the energy and political domain between European Union and Russia whether this will uh, force Serbian government to recalibrate or alter some of its uh, intended policies we we don't know at this stage how do you see that Slovakia Hungary can get import the Russian oil but for Serbia because of the sanctions of the Yanaf they can't use enough to import the Russian oil. Is it fair play, or well, because I think on one hand is little, it sounds a bit of like hypocrisy, you know, that some countries can, but some countries they cannot. Well, this is of course always a problem. I mean, life isn't fair, and in international politics and politics in general is uh, not fair. I mean, of course, you can always say that I mean, with EU membership, yes, there are those countries who are European because they are on the European continent. But there are those who are more European by virtue of being a, a member of the European, uh, by virtue of being a member of the European uh, Union. B uh, you just have to go sometimes on some of the EU uh, custom uh, checks. I mean, even though the Serbia has uh, visa liberalization, still from time to time you do encounter, uh, for example, a nervous customs officer. So you do. You, so these are the kind of things that you do have to take into account, and of course. Hungary and Slovakia used uh, the fact that they were uh, EU member states and, of course, pushed for the solution which uh, favors them. But this also, of course, tells you a different type of uh, story as well, because while uh, European um, Union, of course, uh, is no longer because of all the things which, were, which have uh, happened uh, and some of the disappointments with the prospect of enlargement, is uh, no longer as uh, an appealing uh, issue in Serbian politics as it perhaps uh, was like uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And some people say in a very cynical fashion, well, what do we need, European Union? But uh, there is one argument which is uh, frequently um, stated, is that despite all the shortcomings that the European Union might have, if you're not uh, sitting at the table, you're potentially uh, sitting. Uh, you're potentially on the table as part of the menu. That has been, of course, uh, one of the things, and that it would be better for Serbia to have a seat at the table where it can decide and uh, participate in the in the decision making process uh, concerning uh, rules that uh, that uh, shape uh, Serbian uh, that can shape uh, Serbian society. Of course, some of the troubles that we have seen with. Uh, post-Brexit UK perhaps uh, speak uh, in favor of this line of thinking. Do you think that uh, that Russia can push for sort of energy alliance between Serbia, Hungary and Russia? I clearly doubt that we will be seeing uh, anything uh, as uh, theatrical or anything as uh, powerful of, on, the, on that scale, primarily because I think that both uh, Vucic, Serbian president, and Orban, they are not... Uh, I think that the one thing that people still tend to mistake is uh, they are not uh, pro-Russian or pro-Western. They are pro-Orban and pro-Vucic. So they, they will opportunistically try to, as long as they can, to, as they say uh, in this corner of the globe, to try to milk uh, two cows simultaneously as much as they can, to extract as much concessions as they ha can, to, uh, to pass through this process as painfully as uh, possible 
but uh, I don't think that they would uh, try to do anything which would be on uh, on this type of uh, grand scale, which would attract uh, hostility from uh, Brussels or some or from some other power centers. One of the things that I read that connects uh, Alexander Vucic and Viktor Orban is a possible possible transaction that Serbia is aiming a stake in the future Hungarian nuclear pl- plant. And I'm thinking, like, why? Yes, Russia and Serbia are collaborating, and we always hear about Russian-Serbian relations. Why Rosatom hasn't built any nuclear plant in Serbia? Why Serbia doesn't have a nuclear plant? Well, uh, I mean, in uh, late uh, 2021, uh, Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic, at the time when uh, energy prices were skyrocketing again because the global economy became more open uh, the way after the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, traveled uh, to Sochi and uh, he arranged on that occasion a more preferential uh, gas price from uh, Vladimir Putin. And of course, everybody deduced, including myself, uh, because this was a six months uh, package. So this privileged gas price is well, applied to a six month period. And everybody was saying one thing. This was uh, Putin's gift to Alexander Vucic, uh, which, uh, in, which was intended for two reasons, for the coming heating season. And the fact that uh, Alexander Vucic and Serbia were about to go uh, electoral cycle. So this was a very powerful electoral gift and a very powerful boost uh, for the incumbent uh, Serbian elites. And at that time, everybody was asking because almost certainly it came, uh, it was a quid pro quo transactions because almost certainly the Russian side didn't do it for free. Uh, and uh, for example, one of the things which Serbia did was uh, purchasing uh, Cornet missiles from uh, Russia, even though for the past two years Serbia wasn't buying anything from Russia because it was fearful of US uh, sanctions. But this happened primarily as a result of these transactions. And during this same period, uh, another uh, rumor started to circulate that Rosatom would be building a a nuclear power plant in uh, Serbia. But uh, of course, one of the main, but first thing which emerged after that were comments from Serbian nuclear specialists who said that this should not proceed, number one, because Serbia itself does not have the capacity uh, to to create, even with with, uh, Rosatom's help, nor to man up or operate something of the source. So no material resources, no not enough uh, expertise to man something uh, this ambitious. And of course, if you allow Russians to do so, you are uh, left uh, stuck. Uh, with uh, You create another form of political dependency on the Russian side in terms of uh, having to be dependent or their, on their materials and uh, their expertise, particularly since most of these uh, uh, staff, which, which would uh, hypothetically be... Uh, be situated in this uh, power nuclear power plant that would be constructed would be uh, Russian uh, state employees, government employees. So this one uh, never happened, but uh, the idea that Serbia gets a minority shares in Hungarian-based uh, nuclear power plant has been around for uh, quite a while, and, uh, and Hungarian and Serbian government constantly state in uh, bilateral talks that they will assist each other on issues such as uh, any potential uh, food crisis or energy crisis that they will be there for each other. They evidently value this uh, bilateral partnership that much. So who knows? We will see where it goes. But this idea has been on the table for quite a while. Right. So it was very, very good to block about energy and energy security, Serbia and Russia. Let's go to the second part. And this is a political support and political thinking. In the West, particularly, we have the perception that Russia controls Serbia in some way. And I would like to elaborate on that some way. What does it mean? And my first question is, can you find any breakpoint in Serbian-Russian relations? Because I have a quotation from Vulin, Mr. Vulin, who was the foreign minister of Serbia. And he said, Serbia will never forget the help of Russia and Russian President Vladimir Putin, who, at the invitation of President Vucic, prevented the adoption of a British resolution in the United Nations in 2015 that would have declared the Serbs a genocidal nation. And for some people, this might be a breakpoint in Russian-Serbian relations. 
but let's hear from you. Well, first of all, I mean, the, the very popular uh, notion which you which is present in the commentariat is that this is some uh, partnership which uh, which is based on Slavic and Orthodox ties, and that this partnership has gone uninterrupted for the past 200 years, throughout the century, that it is that powerful and that everything is Slavic and Orthodox ties. But of course, one of the things which I have uh, tried to demystify in my uh, own research was to show them that for the past 200 years, this was actually a much more uh, opportunistic uh, relationship, which had uh, many twists and turns and a lot of uh, upside, ups and downs. Because uh, how close uh, Serbia and Russia tended to be, that always depended on a given historical era. What was the balance of power at that time? What was the strategic environment which drew the two countries together? And of course, the second one was who was in power in uh, either Russia or Serbia? That's why, in anecdotal terms, you have you always have one grandson who heard about the Russians from his grandfather, while other one grandfather would tell you uh, that the Russian brothers helped Serbia. The other one would say that the, the Russian brother betrayed Serbia and left it out to dry. So that tells you, but it all depends, of course, uh, from which era the grandfather comes from. So th this is of so this has always been this uh, uh, case. And uh, as I said, I mean, uh, the latest one, and as I have been frequently, as some uh, Serbian uh, diplomats and government officials, for example, who participated in the, in this uh, formation of the new Serbo-Russian partnership back in 2008, they have told it myself. Ra in between the fall of Milosevic's regime in 2000 and when Kosovo started in 2008, when Kosovo declared independence, the key word he said, before Kosovo started gliding towards independence, Russia did not exist in either our foreign nor foreign policy nor domestic politics. So this has been, of course, uh, so this has been one uh, partnership where uh, Russia saw an interest in trying to back a Serbian case of, on Kosovo, try to get foothold in the Balkans by extension, and an opportunity to uh, irritate and frustrate the West while at the same time increasing its uh, leverage and bargaining power with the West, while Serbia saw that, uh, that there was no other good options because there was no other great power willing to back Serbian case on Kosovo. Okay, China does not recognize independent Kosovo, but then again, uh, China is not interested in sticking out in uh, disputes and conflicts that do not infringe directly on Chinese core strategic interests. So Russia for now is the only... Uh, is the only game in town. However, this also still tells you something about the very uh, opportunistic nature of this partnership, because while they don't speak about it openly and uh, publicly, a Russian leadership knows that Serbian leadership is primarily using them uh, to get a better bargain with the West. While on the other hand, Serbian leadership does not want uh, to be uh, used as a cannon fodder by uh, Moscow, and it is also frequently afraid whether Moscow will uh, betray, sell out Belgrade in some hypothetical uh, great power bargain with the West. So this uh, this tells you partnership exists, but it is a much more uh, enthusiastic uh, partnership than most people believe. And uh, there are so, and there are contradictions in this partnership. And uh, what we were and what we are about to see probably as a result of uh, very objective uh, factors, the fact that. Uh, Russia is under a uh, serious uh, strain from the from the Europeans because of uh, its because of its invasion of Ukraine. So that means that their ability to act the fact to operate effectively in the Balkan is is, is constrained. Serbian leadership doesn't want to uh, risk that much for the sake of uh, Russia. And uh, we now uh, it is uh, it is uh, now working on uh, diversifying its energy supplies. And there is even some pressures from the West to get uh, to finally get a settlement of the Kosovo dispute in order to eliminate this uh, opening that Russia has been uh, using. So while this partnership will not necessarily be uh, terminated, it is uh, definitely being uh, downgraded because of the objective external factors. Also, I can add in March 2022, Serbia voted in favor of the UN General Assembly resolution condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In April, Serbia voted in favor of expelling Russia from the UN Human Rights Council. Many people put Serbia into Russian orbit, but when you're reading the facts, 
not conspiracy or some opinions of sensational news, but facts that as, as they are. You know, we see that Serbia is showing a sort of a limitation what the Russians can actually do with Serbia, which I think it's super significant to mention, especially in these times. Do you see this in the same way? Yes, absolutely. I mean, all of this stuff tells you about uh, how far is Serbia willing uh, to go on uh, some things. I mean, even before the war, uh, Serbia's primary economic partner on almost every objective metric uh, is uh, is European uh, Union. When it comes to uh, security issues, despite the, when it comes to the security issues, despite the fact that NATO is unpopular in uh, in Serbia because of the 1999 and the fact that Serbia does not uh, pursue uh, membership uh, in NATO. I mean, uh, Serbia's most important uh, security interactions do take place with the alliance. Serbia is not uh, interested in joining NATO, but it is a member of NATO's Partnership for Peace program. And within this uh, program, it uh, it exercises the so-called IPAP, Individual Partnership Action Plan, which is the highest level of uh, cooperation that a non-member uh, state can have uh, with the alliance. Serbia conducts more military uh, drills with uh, NATO and uh, bilaterally with NATO member states than it does uh, with uh, with Russia. NATO, uh, NATO troops have uh, diplomatic uh, immunity in Serbia and status of forces uh, agreement. Uh, NATO also has a liaison office which operates uh, in uh, the building of uh, Serbia's defense in ministry where they have uh, diplomatic community. On the other hand, uh, Russian staff in the so-called in the Serbo-Russian humanitarian center in the city of Nish do not have diplomatic immunity despite uh, Russian insistence uh, years in the years behind us. Uh, Russia also does not have a, it has a military representative attached to the Russian embassy, but despite Russian requests, Russian defense ministry does not have a representative office. Uh, a separate representative office like NATO has a liaison office. So that tells you about uh, where Serbian priorities lie, one way or the other. And at the same time, yes, the issue of uh, territorial integrity, yes, I mean, because this is uh, Serbia, because of Kosovo, always said, because of Kosovo, particularly when it comes to the infringement of a country's sovereignty and territorial integrity, we have to vote the way we vote, uh, we vote in, the UN, uh, gen- in the UN General Assembly. Sanctions are unpopular domestically, but this, this is how we have to vote. And I think that another uh, very important breaking point in this uh, relationship is uh, one uh, statement that we had from Serbian President Aleksandar Vucic few weeks ago in, in an interview he gave from for Bloomberg, in which he said, for Serbia, Crimea is Ukrainian and the Donbass is uh, Ukraine as well. Because uh, this is, of course, one very hidden uh, mistrust, because Serbia needs Russia in order to get uh, something which it perceives as a fair, uh, fairer, more uh, as a better or, or more fair settlement of the Kosovo dispute as they perceive it. While on the other hand, Russia sees uh, Kosovo as a very useful uh, leverage tool. I mean, with thanks to Kosovo, Russia was uh, able to uh, justify its uh, imposing, uh, of course, uh, the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. It used it to justify the annexation of Crimea and is now invoking the same precedent in Donbas. And Russia and Serbia does not like this analogy and this tells you uh, a very important uh, a very important uh, difference uh, that is not negligible absolutely one thing i would like to to ask you to to clarify is the following statement serbian foreign affairs minister nikola selakovic signed the agreement with russian foreign minister sergey lavrov for mutual consultations on foreign policy matter between russia and serbia what does it mean? I, I haven't found any information about this. Well, I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, this is not uh, at all uh, unusual because these type of agreements, I mean, speaking as a person who, who briefly worked in the Serbian foreign ministry for two years and who has attended some of these type of meetings, this is, of course, this concerns uh, the so-called uh, bilateral uh, co- the consultations between uh, two foreign ministries on uh, international uh, issues. And they are they are integral part of, of security practices. I mean, where, for example, when I worked in the Serbian foreign ministry, I worked in the sector for uh, security policy, where, for example, you have bilateral consultations with 
X, Y, and Z country about, for example, security policy issues. But uh, of course, uh, this uh, episode was important uh, for uh, two reasons. Number one, because this agreement uh, exists before, which, which essentially applies the delegation from one foreign minister will visit the other and where they will discuss uh, talking points. However, one area was uh, uh, was thrown out from this uh, agreement on consultations, which is precisely security policy. So consular affairs, yes, bilateral relationship, yes, multilateral affairs, how do, how do the two countries uh, meet in the international uh, multilateral bodies, yes, but not security policy. And that was precisely done from the Serbian party to show that as while Russia is involved in the Ukraine war, there is a limit to how far we go in our relationship with Russia. But another very important point is that this is a purely a technical agreement, which uh, could be signed, for example, like a deputy foreign minister or assistant foreign minister or someone else from the hierarchy. It, uh, di it didn't need to involve uh, two foreign ministers. But this was signed uh, in New York at the margin, uh, at the margin of uh, UN General Assembly. And I presume that this was probably done uh, because of the insistence from the Russian side who insisted that this type of agreement, which otherwise would be a technical agreement signed by lower level of uh, representation, uh, was deliberately signed by two foreign ministers, again, for the reasons which I have earlier uh, outlined, uh, the fact which I have outlined earlier. I mean, to show, the, to give this optics to the West Sea, we are not kicked out of Europe. We are not isolated in Europe. One of the last questions for today's interview. In news, we see sometimes some shots from Serbia and it's, there is a connection between Wagner groups and Russia officially or unofficially recruiting some Serbs to fight in Ukraine. And the perception is that sometimes we see the pictures from Serbia with people with the Z sign T-shirt with Russian flags. But as we are in the information war or disinformation war, sometimes we are not 100% sure what's going on in Serbia. Can we please shortly clarify this issue? Because I think that might be very important, especially for my students, to, to have a better or more accurate image of Serbia. Yes. I mean, I think that I can even uh, dissect two important issues from this. One is uh, the nature of this uh, Russian popularity, the nature of this soft power capital. And the other one is uh, the Wagner story, which was in the news. Please. I mean, because when it comes to Russia's popularity in Serbia, what I usually say, I mean, if we take a look at this uh, soft power definition, the way it was envisioned by uh, Joseph Nye, who, uh, who coined the term, I mean, it was always this idea that uh, you can appeal to someone, that you can uh, that you can uh, influence someone else's uh, behavior through your power of uh, attraction based on some uh, innate uh, quality of your society, your politics, your culture, your ideology or something of the sort. But this tells you the key uh, story because Russia is popular in Serbia, but not for what it is, but for what it is not. It is not the West. So despite the fact that uh, society itself is pretty much westernized, because uh, if you come to Belgrade, if anyone has ever visited Belgrade, you will probably, despite uh, the fact that you might find uh, Putin and Z t-shirts to buy, on every major level of everyday life, you probably won't find that much distinction between, any, between Belgrade and any European city. It's pretty much uh, a Western consumer society. But Russia is popular because it is uh, frequently a way for the society at large to vent out its uh, frustration with the West. The Russian popularity is a product of uh, bitter memories of the 1990s and a way to manifest anger at the West for, uh, for encouraging Kosovo's independence. But it is not a product of some uh, innate attractiveness of uh, Russia's uh, political or social model. And it is also not the product of some mystical uh, Slavic and Orthodox uh, types. But of course, this also tells you something about the very powerful uh, domestic uh, forces, which are also shaping uh, Serbian foreign policy uh, towards Russia, because uh, frequently they believe uh, there is some popularity of Russia in the Serbian public opinion. So uh, it is instead of angering uh, pro-Russian parts of the electorate, it is better for me to balance, and that way I can get the votes of both uh, 
pro Russian and uh, pro uh, and pro EU uh, pro EU voters. Now, with the incumbent Serbian government, this popularity of Russia was already high, but it has skyrocketed because uh, Russia, pro-Russian narratives in Serbia are not being pushed by RT or Sputnik. Their audience in Serbia is uh, rather small, despite the fact that they have local bureau and local portals here. The main source of uh, pro-Russian narrative are the local uh, pro-government media and particularly pro-government tabloids. And this was done by the incumbent elites for uh, two very specific reasons. Number one is they believed if we push for this uh, irrational pro-Russian narrative, and I always say this is not even uh, an issue of a Russian narrative, this was a, a radical pro-Russian narrative where sometimes you even create this unrealistic perception that uh, Russian uh, co national interests are identical to Serbia's national interests. But this was done to profit with the pro-Russian parts of the electorate. And number two, this was done as a way to blackmail the West. Because this creates uh, an impression in the West that pro-Russian agents and pro-Russian players are everywhere in Serbia. And in that case, Serbian president appears as the most moderate one. So if he's the only moderate one and the only one who's keeping uh, Russian presence in Serbia at a level that can be tolerated, that means that they will give him a, bl uh, that, that they will give him a blind eye. They will give him a pass on issues like democracy, on rule of law, corruption, media freedoms, and so forth and so forth. But of course, now that we have uh, potential pressures from Serbia to make a decision from the European Union, uh, Serbian leadership has in a way fallen into his, its own trap. Because you cannot reverse the ship that easily without angering significant uh, portions of your own public, which you have uh, fed with this type of narrative for at least uh, eight years. But uh, coming to the Wagner story, I mean, uh, there is not that much evidence that Wagner established uh, that much of a heavy presence. I mean, uh, we, we don't know how many Serbs there are who are fighting in Donbass, but we can say for uh, openly that ever since the Yugoslav wars, mercenaries from former Yugoslavia were present in conflicts worldwide. So that one you cannot, uh, that one you cannot prevent. According to the Ukrainian embassy in Belgrade, in between 2014 and 2019, there were around uh, 300 uh, Serbian uh, foreign fighters fighting in eastern Ukraine. And uh, because, according to the Serbian legislation, uh, participating as a mercenary in foreign conflict is prohibited, somewhere around uh, 30 uh, criminal cases were uh, were handled by the Serbian judiciary precisely on this uh, precisely on this uh, ground. But when it comes to Wagner, we had uh, stories. We had stories that uh, Wagner was interested in registering an entity in Serbia. That they were interested in registering. Uh, that they are interested in uh, registering some form of uh, cultural center, which would combat uh, the narrative of uh, liberal Russian emigres who came to Belgrade escaping uh, from war. So this was and. Uh, we only had also some couple of very minor right-wing activists who were guests of uh, Wagner in that uh, fancy uh, headquarters that this uh, group has established uh, in St. Petersburg. However, there is no presence, there is no evidence of a heavy Russian presence. So this leads some some people to believe that this was a very deliberate uh, information operation, which was intended both to promote uh, Wagner. But uh, also to uh, but uh, also to potentially scare to potentially scare the the Russian uh, popul the Russian community which uh, escaped Russia and uh, came to and came to Belgrade. Of course, we had some other occurrences related to Wagner as well. For example, we had uh, NRT Balkans, which is a local uh, recently opened the news portal of RT. Which basically put on uh, put on an op-ed, uh, which was basically a media story, but which essentially concealed an ad, uh, an ad uh, re which advertised uh, re Wagner uh, Group's uh, recruitment uh, efforts. So, I mean, despite the fact that this ad was uh, concealed as uh, as a media story, uh, this uh, story was very soon rescinded and pulled back from RT's website, I presume precisely through some uh, intervention behind uh, closed doors uh, by, uh, Serb by Serbian uh, leadership. So this episode uh, from Wagner tells you something. Yes, it tells you a story about limitation of, uh, of uh, Serbian uh, Serbo-Russian partnership, where Serbian leadership does not want 
to uh, take any risk uh, for the sake of Russians. And of course, Wagner Group in Serbia is uh, something of painting a target on Serbia's uh, forehead because that attracts attention from players like uh, Washington and others. But it also tells you the way uh, Serbian leadership plays the game. Because, uh, for example, this is a very reminiscent to the situation that we had in late 2019 when a YouTube video emerged of a Russian intelligence officer uh, bribing a retired Serbian military officer. And at that time, how did the Serbian leadership react? On one hand, it's to it told the Western diplomats that this is an example that the Russians are conducting covert operations against Serbia, while on the other hand, they were traveling to Sochi to do damage controls in its uh, relationship with Putin. So in this case, they will probably be doing something similar, telling to the West that this, is, that this shows how much uh, the Russians are pressuring Serbia, while on the other hand, they will be telling the Russians uh, that uh, everything that they have to do is being done because of the Western pressure. So a very, very old established pattern of uh, balancing and playing uh, various external powers against each other. The last question for today is going to be a bit surprising for my viewers, but I would like to go back to your PhD thesis when you were writing about Serbia as balancing the Russia and the West. And can we say, or can we elaborate on three, four main ideas that you can see as a vital for Serbia to be that balancing power or balancing country? Because we can't, I mean, even theoretically say that Serbia will cut all the links with Russia tomorrow. And we also can't say that Serbia will be in the European Union tomorrow. So we have sort of balance. So I would like to go back to your PhD and for our viewers, my students and my colleagues, you know, maybe you can say three, four ideas from your thesis that we should remember when we are researching Serbia, when we are writing about Serbia, and when we want to understand Serbia in much more accurate way, not just from the news or comments that we read and we might come across in news or YouTube. Yes. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, for uh, the IR nerds, because I presume there will be a lot of IR nerds who will be watching uh, this podcast. There is no, of course, PhD without the theory. I have applied uh, neoclassical uh, realism as a framework of analysis. So I presume that uh, Serbia primarily, just like most states, uh, shapes its uh, foreign policy based on what is happening externally, reacting to its external environment. But of course, uh, the shape of this uh, uh, response is dependent on uh, domestic uh, factors. Now, in case of Serbia, I said that uh, systemic factors have shaped Serbia's balancing act, and these two have been the Kosovo dispute, which I treat as an international systemic occurrence because it is a product of uh, great powers making uh, making certain choices and decisions and imposing uh, certain realities of a, on a small country like Serbia. The power vacuum, which I recognize, kicked in in the Balkans ever since the West became more distracted from the region, which, of course, created an opening for Russia, but also created an encouragement for a country like Serbia to hedge its bets and diversify partnership and play off various powers against each other. The third argument is that while these uh, two generate the balancing act, there is a third systemic force, which... Uh, does not generate this balancing act, but actually uh, shapes its uh, intensity, which is Russia-West rivalry. I mean, for example, when they when Serbia saw that the terrain was becoming heated in 2014, it decided that it is even more important now to balance than in the past. But at the same time here, in case of the new Ukraine crisis, when uh, the terrain is even hotter than in 2014, that's where you really, really have to be even more careful about how you conduct this uh, policy. But argument number four, I find uh, that uh, there is a very powerful role of uh, Serbian domestic politics behind this balancing act. It's uh, primarily it's party politics, where I perceive uh, political parties being these opportunistic uh, players uh, whose, le whose leaders and they themselves try to use foreign policy issues in order to uh, win power in the country, to use it as a tool of domestic promotion and domestic legitimacy, where I basically say that party politics in Serbia shapes its foreign policy and its balancing act between Russia and the West, but does so in three key themes. First one is simple, logic of political survival, so that means avoid unpopular policies. Number two, 
political parties trying to be catch all parties, trying to catch these different parts of the Serbian elect electorate with conflicted uh, emotional proclivities. And three, where uh, the where foreign policy in Serbia is being used as a, as a tool of uh, kingmaker game by the local elites. Where, for example, if you uh, take a picture with a big uh, leader, either Putin or someone from the West, you try to use it as a promotional tool to show to your voters that you are internationally respected. Or if you secure a backing from the from the United States or Russia for something that will give you an advantage over over your uh, competition in the elections. So these are the three uh, forms of uh, behavior of how uh, political parties use foreign policy for their domestic ends and which uh, in terms uh, contributes in part to Serbia's foreign policy behavior. So these are as uh, succinct as, as nerdish uh, explanation of my PhD that I can provide. Thank you very much, Dr. Vuksanovic. But I would also stop you here because Dr. Vuksanovic is working on his book. And this book is going to be published when, approximately? Well, the manuscript deadline is for the end of this year. Afterwards, we will see. Afterwards, it depends on the publisher, not me. Right. So I think that's a good time to finish this talk show now, so Dr. Vuksanovic has more time to finish his book and we can read it sooner. Dr. Vuksanovic, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for elaborating on Russian, on Hungarian, and even about regional geopolitics around Serbia, which is fascinating, which is, I think, perfect research topic. There is always something to write about Serbia and the neighbors, Serbia and the global politics. So thank you again. Thank you very much for this. Really appreciate. And thank you for our viewers for watching us and see you next time. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you.